Hi there, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're working on changing the slide. Uh, but what we have right now is our panel on network programmability. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of very interesting topics, obviously, in the move from networking to pr network programmability. And you've heard a lot about uh, DNA, our digital network architecture. And here what we have are leaders from across the company who are working on making all of this real. So let me ask you a few questions. So how many of you uh, are using network programmability in your running networks today? You. How many of you are learning about network programmability? Okay. So, uh, so here's a question is, you know, dumping, uh, jumping into a little bit of detail, is how many people he have heard of like NetConf and RestConf and Yang? Okay. How many people have used it? NetConf, RestConf, and Yang. And then uh, how many people know the difference between them? Okay. Great. So we have a mixture of people who are, I would say, newer to network programmability and a few people who've actually really dived in quite a bit. So, uh, so let me ask our panel. So first of all, can everybody just please take a moment and uh, introduce yourselves and talk, say what you do? Sure. Uh, Adam. Okay. Uh, Adam Redford. I'm a distinguished systems engineer. Um, I work with customers. I'm in the field. And my area of focus is network programmability. I, uh, my background is software, so I spent 10 years of my life writing software for a living basically network automation software so that I could spend less time working and more time <laughs> training for triathlons at the time. <laughs> That's a, everyone has different motivations for using network uh, automation and programmability. <laughs> Mark? Cool. So I'm Mark Montanez. I lead the, uh, the architecture team for DNA. And uh, I'm looking to make this stuff real. I'm super excited about what we can do is we combine a network controller and drive automation into the network infrastructure to address real problems. So I'd we'll be interested to, to see where you guys are at in that path. Great. Hi, my name is Colin Lohenberg. I'm on the Meraki product management team, and I lead all of our APIs and our developer ecosystem, building applications for network programmability, analytics, and additional services that run on top of the Meraki platform. Excellent. And I'm Rob Grasby. I'm part of the Enterprise Product Management uh, Organization. I lead the team responsible for device programmability, covering uh, program, uh, programmatic APIs, NetConf, RustConf, Yang data models on our devices, Python scripting, on-device app hosting, simplified provisioning of our devices. So anything for ranging from configuring a device to telemetry from the device. Excellent. Great, so you can see that we have people from all different uh, types of backgrounds, uh, people who work very closely with customers. Uh, you're all veterans as well in the networking community. So uh, question, what is network programmability? You can just uh, go down the line. <laughs> I think network programmability is just the ability for you to configure your network with a script that's at the simplest level, is being to able to script your network configuration uh, and then also to build applications on top of that is really the, the end goal of network programmability, is taking other programs and connecting them with your network data and to configure and also pull out and monitor and pull analytics from them. Yeah, excellent. And I think I take a look at, at, at network programmability as the ability to like, express intent and get that reflected in the network elements, and not just like one network element, but the network, so that we can make Things in the past were super complex, network element by network element, make that easy when we look at the whole system. So end-to-end -end quality of service, or end-to-end -end high availability, end-to-end -end segmentation that in the past, node by node, hop by hop in the network, super tough. Now that we can do things with automation and programmability, make that simple and easy to apply. And I think one of the key aspects of this is that when you move to a programmability model where you're making change via the machine, there's an element of trust there. So a lot of the focus around programmability initially is around making change, but I think the critical element is actually the ability to get analytics out of the network and, t and an understanding of assurance around that the change that you made has actually done what it's supposed to do. So a lot of focus around making change, but equally important is the ability to extract information from the network to understand the implications of that change. Yeah, and from my perspective, network programmability is all about automating network operations to get the, the business value that you're looking for out of the network um, elements. Whether that's um, automating configuration of a device, 
automating how you respond to activities happening on the device, whether it's a, 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 an event that's created due to you know, um, operating parameters going outside a, a defined range, whether it's um, security events you're reacting to, you can automate a response to that based on the business process, business rules that you want to create. Okay, so now if, uh, we know that there's uh, different elements of network programmability that are key, but uh, you know, it's a journey and it takes time to do it. So is there something interesting about network programmability now? Like why would we have it now? I'd say it, it definitely is a journey and it, you know, it's a learning along the way. So I think it's, it's defining at a high level the architecture that makes the most sense for your organization. Do you want to centralize programmability of the network through an SDN controller, or do you want to manage individual devices uh, directly? And, and that's a major architectural decision for any organization to make, and it has uh, long-term implications. If you go at a device level, you can effectively, over time, automate any capability that the device has. If you go to a controller level, you're abstracting that control and automation of the underlying network elements, but the capabilities uh, that you can um, achieve are uh, more limited by the capabilities of the controller itself. So it's really that first architectural decision of what capabilities do you really want, how much do you want to invest in automation and programmability, and what architecture makes the most sense for you. The way I see network programmability benefiting you and wh why do you care, what can you do today, is really about making a network deployment or network monitoring easier. So while network programmability sounds complex, sounds hard, sounds like it's going to take me years to get to a programmable network, we have this capability on Cisco today and we have lots of vendors out there who are rushing from becoming IT resellers to IT and IT professional services to IT programmers and IT developers and this new wave of engineers who can code and script and make their deployment easier. So it's actually simplifying that, in, that effort, that level of effort and distilling it down to, hey, I can do this and it's really easy to get started because we're opening up those, those avenues through DevNet and through our developers program to let you jump right into network programmability, and there's a lot today on the DevNet webpage uh, that can get you started, and it's not something that you have to wait for this to come. Uh, there's more coming, but it's right now, right now, you can go and start coding today or start using sample code uh, right, from, right from scratch. And I think that's the exciting piece, right? It's just that we can suck that operational expense out of the operating the network now and, and, and lean into automation, and the tools are there. It's not like we're, we're waiting or you just have to start beginning. You have real problems you need to solve. You can solve them at scale now uh, and, and consistently instead of that device by device, individual person at the keyboard, CLI kind of a thing. So uh, but now is the time because the, the technology's matured enough that it's there across everything we have. Excellent. So, I think there's two interesting aspects to this. One is that if you ask the question, why is this important and why now? Uh, my response to that, and it's going to sound like a marketing response, but bear with me, I have engineer in my title. Um, I think digitization is, is really what's driving this, right? Because what is, the, what is the underlying implication of digitization? Change. Change in terms of the applications that are important, change in terms of how they're delivered. So the underlying implication of digitization is about change. The other aspect that I think is important is what is the e expectation of people working in IT today? Automation. And if you look at it, the enterprise network is the last bastion, it's the last domino of manual process. And it can't sustain that for much longer. And I'm sure all of you are under pressure, right? Do it faster, do it quicker, do it better. That's why you're here. <laughs> Very true. Uh, so, uh, so there's a lot of uh, good reasons, business reasons, uh, just the reality of the speed of change, uh, in terms of getting into network programmability. But now let's break it down into the components and the technologies. And just to level set all of this, I'm going to ask Adam to just jump in and tell us what are the components and technologies of uh, network programmability that uh, people should understand. So I'm a, I'm a simple person. I, I tend to think in threes. That's about the most my, my brain can <laughs> handle. So on one side there is, and the first thing is the, the tools and the uh, technologies that you're using to, to automate. And that might be something like a tool set like Ansible or um, Puppet or Chef. 
It might be a scripting language like Python or Go. So there's a set of tools that you're using to perform automation. The next thing is, what are you actually automating? Is it an individual device, or is it a set of devices that are treated as a system through a, a controller of some sort? And then the kind of the most interesting bit is how you're going to do that. So how are you connecting the, the tools that you're using to the devices or the controllers that you're automating? And there's a bunch of different approaches there. There's some very um, specific protocols, like um, PXGrid, for example, that we use in ISE. There are some very domain-specific protocols, like NetConfYang and RESTConf. And then there are some general protocols, like REST and REST APIs, that are probably the, the most common um, approach in terms of how you do that integration. Uh, so uh, as you uh, dive into that, so we have kind of device-level APIs, we have controller-level APIs, and then we're putting together security and different features like that. And then you also talked about NetConf, RESTConf, yeah, and can you tell us so that I think some of the folks in our audience already know, but we often use all of those terms together. What do they mean? Yep. So there's a lot of, who thinks uh, NetConf and, who knows the difference between NetConf and Yang? Yeah. That's OK, because we tend to bundle them together for very good reason. Who knows when the first uh, NetConf inst instance shipped in iOS? What year? 2004, we first shipped NetConf in iOS. Now, NetConf is just a transport protocol, right? It's reliable. It's based on SSH. It gives us a way of securely connecting into the device. Um, NetConf has uh, a bunch of attributes that are quite powerful. Notionally, the way that the remote procedure calls work, so I can do some things to configuration data, I can edit configurations, and I can do some things to get what's called operational data. Remember I spoke before about the ability to make change as well as get information back, so it supports those concepts. Now the challenge with NetConf initially was that there was no way of structuring the data in a way that was easy for machines to understand. Essentially what we were pushing is CLI blocks and then screen scraping essentially the response that came back. Hence the, the rise of Yang, which is a modeling language that allows us to structure the data that we send and, more importantly, understand the data that we get back. So NetConf and Yang go together, but NetConf is the transport and Yang is the way that that data is encapsulated or modeled. Excellent. And then there's also been uh, talk about RESTConf. So can you talk about RESTConf as well? Yeah, so obviously with the um, rise of REST APIs and just another point of um, Clarification, anyone who says that REST is a standard is lying. REST is a philosophy and approach to developing an API. Um, so it's quite ambiguous in terms of how you implement it. Now, when we say that RESTConf, or we use the word RESTConf, we're not saying that it's necessarily a fully RESTful API. It's a RESTful approximation of the semantics of NetConf encapsulated in, in REST. Uh, <laughs> in the REST paradigm. Yes, yes, yes. So one of the challenges is if you look at the way that you interact with the device with NetConf, it's not identical when you use RESTConf. It's close to, but there's some, some little areas where it differs. Excellent. So, uh, so with all of this, we're talking about, again, device and controller level programmability, but then also kind of a model-driven approach, right? So when we're using some of these. Uh, you know, so what are the kind of the near-term and long-term in terms of what, are we, what type of programmability are we using in these APIs? So today, yeah, we've just released um, NetConf on iOS XE. Um, so we've got full NetConf support on iOS XE. Obviously, we're getting uh, RESTConf fairly soon. And that's kind of the approach that we've taken in terms of the way that we're communicating with devices. Um, one of the challenges that we have from a controller perspective is that you all love um, upgrading your network infrastructure, doing a complete refresh of it, going to the latest version of code, don't you? Yeah? Yeah? No. 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 <laughs> so Not one of the that. things that we're very conscious of is the fact that there are a large uh, series of devices out there that don't support NetConf and Yang, or Yang more importantly, that we need to take into account. Now, that's the beauty of a controller model, because the controller is an abstraction point, right? If I interact with the network through a controller, do I know or care what the southbound protocol is? Do I know what the Meraki system manager uses to communicate? Do I care? You don't care. Yeah. In fact, that's kind of the point, is yeah. you have a controller, so you talk to the controller, and yeah. then wh whether it uses NetConf for its own proprietary connections to the device, then you don't need to care, because you're just writing software for a controller. So yeah. it abstracts that, that level. 
Yep. So, uh, so great. So, can you guys talk about how network programmability fits into the Cisco DNA architecture? Yep. Maybe so Mark. I'll take that one. Yeah. Uh, when we look at DNA, I know you guys have seen the the uh, three layer cake stack uh, of the DNA architecture. Where at the bottom we have the infrastructure layer, all of the devices that we're talking about, and that's where uh, the the whole discussion we've been having about the APIs to talk to those net network elements live. In the middle of the DNA architecture is the automation layer of that architecture and the assurance and analytics layer. Those are uh, control functions that are there to abstract the details of all of those network elements that live below so that you can write programs that live at the very top of this architecture to deal with the network infrastructure below it. So an example of that is the EasyQuaz application that lives inside of APIC EM, and that application allows you to express quality of service intent at a very high level. So video is important to me, Netflix not so much in an enterprise context, really express that high level business intent that drives to detailed level configuration across wired, wireless, and routing infrastructure inside of your environment end to end. So you didn't have to know the difference between how many queues and what drop thresholds exist in a whole bunch of different access layer switches, how to convert between DSCP and upmarking in the wireless LAN space, and how to handle shaping in the wide area network environment. The controller abstracted all of that and allowed you to write an application at the top that said prioritize my voice and video, deprioritize Netflix in my environment because I don't want to spend resources for it. So right in the middle, that's the, the controller piece that gives us that, uh, that abstraction. Excellent, excellent. Um, Colin, so you're uh, obviously driving Cisco Meraki. How does Meraki fit into all of this? That's great, and actually, I think it, what, what he just explained is, is very similar. So the entire DNA story is very similar to the Meraki story, and Meraki's cloud, the Cisco Meraki cloud, is the DNA cloud controller. We don't call it a controller because it's in the cloud and it's not an on-premise controller you have to install, but it works just like a controller because you have an API that you can write to at any, from anywhere in the world, you can make an API call. Now this means everyone who's like, we don't have a CLI from Rocky, well guess what, we do. You can use any CLI with our API, you can use any application to program with our RESTful API. And we've abstracted that layer of net, you know, what, what's going on in the background, you don't see the controller talking to the device, and we're, we provide a secure way to talk to our cloud. So the DNA cloud controller is just the Cisco Meraki cloud. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so uh, Rob, you've been working a lot on uh, DNA and how we can push it forward, so what are some of your thoughts on top so of that? So from my perspective, you know, I'm, I'm responsible for the device level API, so I'm, I'm the secret sauce in a way that talks to the controller. But we're using open protocols to talk to the controller level in the DNA architecture. So we'll be using you know, NetConf protocol, Yang data models um, as a way to configure devices and uh, report um, um, analytics data northbound to our, our, our controllers and network data platforms. So effectively, you know, we want to use open interfaces that Cisco can consume with our other higher level products in the DNA stack or expose them to third party developers, to customers to build custom integration to the device themselves. So all the APIs that we're consuming in our DNA, arch arch DNA architecture are also available to you and to ISVs to build custom integrations against. Yeah, so I, um, my perspective on this is if you think about why APIs are important, what's the answer to that? You know, we've spoken a lot about automation, but there's really three basic sets of use cases for APIs. One is around automation and um, efficiency and predictability, because that's what automation gives you. The other is around integration, which is how you tie the network into other things. So we've got examples of the network integrating into communications manager, the network integrating into security. There's a whole range of integrations that you can do and opportunities for partners and other people to tie into network capabilities. And the third one that I think is probably the most underplayed right now is this notion of innovation. Because the things that we build into our products are uh, based on a broad set of customer use cases and so no, may not necessarily match what you want to do. But if we expose everything through an API, you can take advantage of the heavy lifting that we've done and there's do the bit that matters and the bit that's different for your environment and you can innovate and then what will happen is potentially that will come back into the, the core technology and the core product. I think, I think in the DevNet zone you can see some of those innovators yeah. 
building on top of Cisco as a platform of APIs, building their software and coming out with new technologies that maybe we should acquire or maybe we should partner with. And you can see some of those around here. Yeah, and I think that's really the exciting, the exciting thing that happens when we put this controller into the network. Because innovating at every little network element layer, that's tedious and it's hard, and every time they change the code, you have to keep up with all that and the features. When we get that abstraction layer in the middle and innovate on top of that, that's where we can affect change network-wide fast. Excellent. So uh, if we, uh, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to uh, ask the audience if you guys have questions, so you can feel free to add your own questions. Um, so I'll ask one more question, then after I'll see if any of you have questions. Um, so why don't we, can we talk specifically, like what are some of the APIs that we're offering in this world of uh, network programmability? I've got three APIs that I love to talk about. Uh, <laughs> and, and they actually match risky. up exactly with what Adam's saying. Network automation through the dashboard API gives you access to everything you have on the dashboard via API. Can and, you, uh, why don't you describe what's on the and, dashboard? And, and the dashboard with the Cisco Meraki dashboard gives you all the capabilities to orchestrate and automate some of, you know, all of your network deployment. So you can add all your devices to the cloud with one click. Uh, just by claiming your order number, all of your devices get added to your inventory and then you can put them into templates and configure them on the dashboard. Uh, that's going to take a couple clicks. Maybe it takes you an hour per site for a full stack of equipment. But with an API, instead of one hour per site, you now ha have that site done in one minute because you wrote a script and you automated that configuration. So you're reducing the time to deploy from an hour to one minute or less, or, one se or even milliseconds to, to execute the commands that you normally would. And the other big API that everyone loves uh, with, with both Cisco CMX and with Cisco Meraki, we both have APIs that give you location data. So every Wi-Fi and Bluetooth device in the DevNet zone right now is being tracked and you can see a demo at our booth or at the Dev IoT booth and you can see uh, and you could use Cisco on-prem with CMX or you could use Cisco Meraki and you have that same API to get that data out and see all those devices moving around on a map and where, how long they're spending time. And now we've even integrated the two so Cisco CMX and Cisco Meraki work together so if you want to use a hybrid network you can actually use Meraki and Aeronet APs on a Cisco CMX. So that's what APIs have allowed us to do. Excellent. Excellent. So on the device level, you know, we look at it holistically first at the operating system. So we've got a common set of Cisco IOS XE APIs that would apply across our switching, routing, and wireless platforms. Um, out of those APIs, it's a combination of configuration APIs and operational data APIs. There will be APIs like um, interface configuration, BGP, OSPF configuration, um, telemetry data, you can get CPU, environmentals, um, syslog. Um, so all these are native functions on iOS XE. There's also a, a huge industry movement right now to standardize device level APIs across the industry. There's various standards bodies um, driving harmonization ranging from the IETF, IEEE, ITU. Uh, there's also industry led um, ventures like OpenConfig which is a, a Google-led open source initiative to define common device level API behaviors. And that, that, this, this um, open config models, uh, they call them, there'd be open config models for BGP, OSPF as well, interfaces, VLANs, and all these are forming. One of the challenges we have as uh, network vendors and developers and you as customers is the pace of change of the open config models, it's very fast. They're, very, they're moving at web speed. We're seeing APIs spinning six times in six months. So as an enterprise developer, you're looking for stable. Some of the open config models aren't there yet. They're great for a web organization, maybe not so good today until they stabilize for an enterprise environment. The IETF models are moving at a much more enterprise normal pace, you know, very structured, uh, going through a lot of rounds of ratification, a little bit slow sometimes, but they are normalizing and, and they, they are formed. So we'll be, we'll be supporting a combination of ITF, open models, open config, open models, as well as Cisco native models, which give you full access to the underlying functionality of the device. So a whole range of APIs available on the platforms themselves. Great. Uh, do you want to talk about any of our controller level APIs? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, how many people have the ability to come up with an iOS configuration somewhat semi-programmatically? <coughs> yeah? How many people have the ability to get that onto a device? 
in an automated way, reliably. <laughs> so plug and play is one of my favorite controller APIs. Um, simply because it exposes all of the semantics of plug and play. I can programmatically generate a configuration based on template using Ginger or whatever I like. I can upload that using an API to the controller. I can create a rule using the controller. We're just about to launch our cloud um, redirection service, so that device can contact the controller from anywhere in the world. And it's a really cool way of getting devices up and running onto the network. Excellent. So I'll just extend with one of my, the, my favorite extensions to the controller or the way that we've leveraged APIs into the controller to make quality of service that much more powerful. So we have a set of APIs that are exposed to allow a trusted system, in this case the unified call manager, to talk to APKM and in real time identify a device that's making a phone call and the specific information about that phone call so that the network controller can reach out and, and touch the network elements in path and make sure that the, that individual phone call is prioritized and that we have done that end to end through the network, especially for these soft clients. That's a challenge today, right? Soft clients, you're not really in charge of that endpoint. You can't trust it and know that it's there. But now that I have that call control element that I can trust has a relationship with the controller, gives me the ability to prioritize that traffic set up and tear down quality of service for those things. That's first for unified call manager, but because it's a set of APIs and we've published those RESTful APIs, we can integrate with other third-party call control and other trusted devices that need to prioritize applications on the network. It doesn't have to just apply to call control, although that's the first solution set that we're bringing there. And it really is simple, right? It's so simple that I could even write something to talk to Link. So I wrote a link proxy to talk to communication to uh, APKM. Took me about an hour to do. And I think we've packaged this well together. One, one good example is the fast lane. So we came out with a feature to optimize Apple devices on both Cisco and uh, on all Cisco products. Uh, and native to the Meraki dashboard and systems manager, you can fast lane any app on the app store. You can just enable fast lane on that app, and it will then enable fast lane across your entire network automatically, adding quality of service for that application. Anywhere that device roams, that application is going to get quality service automatically. So it's really not about adding complexity to your job, but making your job easier, because now you just click a few buttons, and now you've deployed quality of service for that fast lane app. As well, we're certifying Fastlane apps that build Fastlane into their app, and the DevNet team is actually the ones doing some of that testing on the back end to certify apps that are being coming first Fastlane certified across all Cisco products. How many of you heard about the uh, uh, Cisco and Apple uh, partnership for these uh, Fastlane apps? No? So, uh, yeah, so. So Apple and Cisco are working very closely together, uh, both on the device management side so that we can manage your iOS and Android devices. But on a fast lane side, Apple really wanted a way to get into the enterprise and say, look, Apple devices are enterprise ready. Apple devices can handle quality of service. And they really needed the network to cooperate with the device. And so we've been that intermediary, either using systems manager to say, hey, I want this device to have this application, and I want that application to be higher quality of service because it's a Skype or Link soft, soft yeah. client, uh, or, or using the network to say, I see this application on the network, and I need to give it that access. So we, we've given the power to Apple and app developers to now make their apps faster on their corporate network. <coughs> so you could go do this if you have a soft client or your own custom app. You could make it fast lane, fast lane certified very easily with a couple lines of code. So it's uh, very interesting because there's a big change in networking where networking was just about connections and speed, uh, but now the network actually knows about apps and cares about apps. So that's a really big shift. Is that a big shift or is that something we've been doing the whole time? Well, so I think the, the thing that SDN has brought to this environment is the ability to, to conquer that last mile, right? Because it the, the challenge has always been how do I know that I'm, I, can, I can trust that application from the endpoint into the network in a wireless environment, that's a big deal, right? The, the biggest bottleneck besides the WAN is that wireless environment that we need to do the right things for, and it's always been a challenge. Fastlane and what we're able to do now to automate those configurations really lets us conquer that all the way to the edge, and that was something we couldn't do without APIs and a well-defined interface. So I think, yeah, we've, historically, we have had the ability to identify applications, but 
the ability to change the identification or to change the applications that were important or not was really slow. Yes. Because the network could be configured to identify an application, but that process took six months, and once you'd done it, you never touched it. Yes. So the big thing that's changed is not only do we have the visibility, but we have the ability through controllers to make that change Great. dynamic. Excellent, excellent. Um, can I ask, do we have some questions from the audience? Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Yes. Uh, the microphone is right here. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, Adam, you mentioned that uh, you know some of the engineers are coming under pressure to do things yeah, faster. I'm sorry, we hand. can't. You can not hear. Uh, you can also speak loudly, and then. Okay. Yes. Um, so, Adam, you mentioned that um, some people are under pressure to do things faster, do things better. Yep. Um, I think a lot of the time, in some companies, engineers recognize already that they need to do these things, they need to adopt this, yep. but they then need to actually convince their company yep. that they need to adopt these processes. What, what, sort of, uh, what advice can you give to people to address their own companies about adopting these kind of technologies? Oh. Okay, so if I rephrase the question, um, a lot of people are under pressure inside their own companies to, to do things faster and more automated way. And what advice could I give people to go back into their companies in terms of how to get started? Is that that's fair. Um, who likes change? Keep your hand up, keep your hand up. I haven't finished. Who likes change done to you rather than by you? Oh. <laughs> so that's part of the answer to my question, is that one of the things I think that's important is that we've got a choice here as network engineers. We've got a choice in terms of we can see this tsunami coming and we can wait for it to hit us and have change done to us or we can try and be proactive and, and get ahead of it and start the process. Now, the other thing that's important is that in your organization, is the amount of change that happens relative to, uh, related to the amount of disruption that occurs. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So one of the important points here is I think most organizations recognize that any sort of process or cultural change has implications, and it's not necessarily about Big Bang. I think what's important, and in my discussion with customers, is they see this pressure coming, and they're not expected to go from zero to hero in a week. Oh. What the expectation is that they're showing a trajectory and a plan of how they're going to move forward, and it's almost like, and I overuse the word agile, but this iterative approach where you start really simple, and I think the key thing is to start with simple use cases. Don't start with the most complex, because that's going to end up a nightmare. Um, the other important point that I would make here is that this is a skills change. And how do you get better at skills? You practice, right? Yep. The important point is that when you're starting out, the reason you should need to keep the scope small and work in small steps is that you need to be good at a small thing first before you can progress. A lot of engineers will say to me, oh, I tried plug and play. And it took me longer to deploy plug and play, one switch plug and play than it, than it would have if I'd done it manually. That's absolutely right, because you're investing up front in a process that is replicable and will give you a, a much greater return over the long term, and you're acquiring new skills at the same time. So I think it's really important that you start small. I think it's really important that you show a plan and trajectory, and it's very important that you set the right expectations in needing to invest in skills up front. And it's not going to happen fast day one because you're going to be acquiring skills. But Good question. Are there uh, other questions from the audience? Um, one thing that I want to do is I see that I think you two have seemed to get pretty far. Yes, you. <laughs> and uh, your implementation of, uh, you know, of network programmability. Do you want to share a little bit about what you've done? If you don't want to, that's OK. But this is, uh, you're getting punished because you are raising your hand. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, I'm working at OVH. So we're a cloud company, basically. And uh, what we've done is that we have a system that's able to send transactions, basically, to uh, uh, switches, routers, in a multi-vendor system. Um, what I'm interested in uh, right now is actually having a standard to actually um, automate that further, to have uh, to be faster to develop no, uh, new features, because um, 
The problem is with the open config is that you don't have that much uh, that many features. And uh, what yeah, we would uh, like to see first is a standard across transport in both uh, model. I mean, uh, you have NetConf, you have ResConf, you yep. have gRPC from Google that's coming up yep. too. Uh, but they are not standard yet. Um, they are used by you, by Arista too. Other companies are going in that direction, but there's no standard saying, okay, you should do Young and Net, um, well, NetConf, yes, but uh, Young and ResConf, for example. Uh, NetConf is good, but it's SSH, so it's quite slow. Yep. I mean, you, in our network, it, take, it can take up to five seconds for the initial end shake. That's the capabilities that's, exchange, right? Yep. Yeah. Yes. So that's the kind of thing we are looking at right now. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, that's how, I mean, could, do you have any answers to that? So I think sure. this is a question for the device could, could you API. Paraphrase? Right. So yes. yeah, repeat I'll, the question if yeah, you can. I'll, I'll paraphrase what I heard. So your question is really about how do you do this broadly across multi-vendor? Um, your frustration is that while things like open config exist, they're changing very rapidly and they're not really standardized. Um, and you're interested in both the transport as well as the, um, the data model approach. Uh, I just wanted to make and, one uh, And I think there was one, one more critical element is that you're a cloud provider. Yes. So, like, so uh, you yeah. have been uh, some extra complexity because of their cloud operations as sure. well. So, and you also expressed some frustration with NetConf in terms of the capabilities exchange and how long it takes to, to uh, connect to the protocol. Um, and then things like gRPC are not necessarily standardized. So that tees it up pretty nicely for yeah. you, Rob. OK, so I think there's a number of different approaches you can take in a multi-vendor environment. And that's the reality of our industry, first of all. So we recognize that um, you could still go with an abstraction layer, like you know, a controller, APIC enterprise module, and use that to manage an island of Cisco devices and have another vendor's controller or other approach. Uh, we've seen a number of customers taking that approach. Um, the other approach is you could use you know, data models, open config models, IETF models as a common element. Where we're seeing customers um, adopting a, a workflow is more using a config replace functionality. So not getting into managing um, individual configurations on a per device basis, but managing a consistent workflow where they boot up the device and they load a, a defined configuration for that specific device in that role. Um, and that gives you largely you know, more heterogeneous uh, uh, support. And then for the key parameters that are critical, maybe ACLs, uh, maybe MacSec, uh, maybe you use open config for those you know, few key tweaks that you'd make. So that's one strategy we're seeing in large um, uh, multi-vendor environments. So, I, I wanted to say, uh, we, uh, we see a lot of customers asking for this multi-vendor approach, and we're working with a lot of those software providers like SolarWinds and Logic Monitor that build multi-vendor solutions, uh, and we work with them to make sure that they adopt the Cisco Meraki APIs and the APIC e e APIs so they can tie us into their software. If you're building your own software application in the cloud, it sounds like you are, uh, and, and you're already a cloud competent company and you're ready to be cloud, obviously the Cisco Meraki cloud is going to be a cloud to cloud connection. So you're, you're abstracting that device API, so he's the device API expert, I'm the cloud API expert. So if you want to abstract that level, you no longer have to care about the standards that we're using to manage the devices. We're using our own secure tunneling to each device and you only need to integrate with one API to our cloud and the Cisco cloud APIs will let you manage that in a multi-vendor multi environment on your dashboard. And we've seen a lot of customers do that where they have a mix of Cisco and non-Cisco products on the same dashboard. Basically, building a dashboard on top of our dashboard. And yeah. just to come back to some of the technical details that you raised, so the way that most people are handling the, the NetConf startup issue, and the issue there is obviously the capabilities exchanges, is through keeping connections open, so persistent connections. Um, the other point I'd make is that RESTConf has just become a standard, so RFC now, so that's good. So you've got an alternative way. And obviously we see other protocols coming along like gRPC that will be presumably standardized or other ways of getting access to that telemetry data. I think that's the evolving area. A lot of the focuses have been around the sort of config push operational data um, grabbed via NetConf, RESTConf. And I think the next sort of wave is how we get that telemetry from the device, because I think that's the critical piece. And it's a little bit later, or 
a little bit less mature in terms of where it's at right now. I think it's the other part of this too, you know, that we there's a vacuum for multi-vendor support and we'll see third-party vendors coming in to start to fill that niche as well, that hole. And uh, Puppet is over here uh, demoing uh, NetConf integration to Cisco devices, but they're, you know, they basically can act as an abstraction layer to any uh, network element. And we're seeing other vendors in, in the DevOps space, Ansible, uh, Chef to a degree, you know, looking at multi-vendor support as well. So there's a number of options. There's open source uh, tools like um, oh, Napalm, you know, that are just doing CLI abstractions. There's a lot of different tools, different approaches out there. Can you talk about those tools some more? Because you mentioned Ansible, Puppet, I've seen that. I've, you know, I've seen uh, some, some companies like SolarWinds and Logic Monitor building things. But what, what I, I personally love just using Postman and writing scripts in Postman because it's easy to explain. But what tools do you guys use when you're, when you're building your software or building your, your multi-vendor style environment? Well, I don't build alt multi-vendor, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in terms of the tools, um, yeah, so I think there's a variety of different layers. Um, so a bunch of people are just using SSH, and there's some really good SSH libraries out there. Um, there's also something called WSMA that's been built into iOS since 2007, Web Services Management Architecture, uh, not model-driven, but a reliable way of uh, interacting with devices. And then, probably more recently, all of the focus is going around NetConf Yang. So if you're looking at how you, you interact in the future, it's, it's NetConf Yang, RESTConf, model-driven. And I think if you look at, at, at the, the APIC EM controller today, or the, the, uh, the private extensions that we won't support for third-party devices, so that evolves over time as well. So just to, to answer Colin's question around what do I actually use, um, most of my stuff is written in Python. Yeah. So, Python, yep. Uh, and there's some really good libraries that we've come out with for interacting with APKM. So there's something called Unique that is a, a client library for APKM that makes it really easy to interact. There's YDK that we've worked on that makes it really easy to interact with NetConf Yang. Uh, and there's a bunch more tools that you see in the DevNet zone. I've been working on something called NCC and Flask NetConf with Ina. So there's a bunch of things that we've been working on to make it easier to interact with NetConf. I'm going to ask you to write a blog post on the tools. Oh, yeah. great. We'll, have to, we'll add yeah. that to the, Let's, we have a DNA community on DevNet, so uh, we'll get Adam to post there. You know, I'm in my five blogs in five there, days challenge. <laughs> there's there's, some, there's some good training on the tools, so Postman is my recommendation if you're new to APIs, because you can just get started right away with Postman, and there's a DevNet Learning Lab on it, and it works, it's focused on APIC EM, but you could also use it with the Meraki API as well. Uh, and PyCharm is my favorite IDE for Python. Nice. I love that interface. So if you want to see a demo, go to D7. We, we can show you how PyCharm is really cool. So Nice. So question, uh, what, what's better? Uh, and I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave in a minute. So uh, what's better, uh, network programmability or SNMP? Ooh. Ooh, so That's... how many people um, have used SNMP? How many people <laughs> know what the S stands for in SNMP? <laughs> Does anyone know? Simple. Simple. Does anyone see the incongruity in those two <laughs> questions? <laughs> and I am being a little bit facetious because if you look at it from the outside, uh, SNMP has a structured data model, SNMP has security, SNMP has operational data as well as config data. No one used it correctly, but it had it. Uh, and I think it actually comes back to two key concepts. One is perceived complexity, which in this case is real. And the more important thing is the tools and the um, applications that you have to take advantage of it. So you didn't see a flourishing community of tools like things like YDK, Flask, NetConf, um, NCC around SNMP. You saw people struggling with these proprietary heavyweight tools that took an entire server to run. And you saw vendors struggling to implement an SNMP stack that would, would reflect their full set of capabilities. Because vendors didn't implement the full set of capabilities because it was too hard, therefore people didn't use it, and it was only a subset of things that you could get access to. Excellent. So uh, what's the uh, final takeaway or just advice that you would give to our DevNet audience here? I'd say final words. You know, final takeaway, start getting your hands dirty. You know, play a bit, like as Adam was saying, you'll start learning. You, know, you invest now and you, you play, learn. Understand the art of the possible. For, for yourselves, you may not want to become the expert programmer, but understand you know, by playing and, and, and exploring what network automation, what network programmability can do for your organization. That would be my key takeaway. Colin? I would suggest going to the DevNet site, 
taking the Learning Lab 101, uh, going to the Meraki part of the DevNet site, and getting a Meraki access point uh, by signing up. Uh, and we'll get you the gear you need so you can start developing your applications and get started by getting the gear in your hands, in your home, and start playing around with it um, but before you go and present it to your boss. Yep. <laughs> and I'd say same thing, get started now, right? So Epic EM is available. Uh, the, download Epic EM, start playing with it, and start small, right? So uh, one device, small policy, you don't need to conquer the world to start and get comfortable with what you can do, because there's lots of power, even in just read-only and, and looking at what you can do, exploring the network information database that a controller gives you across the whole infrastructure. Um, I would recommend go and take a look at my blog series. There's about 20 blogs that I've posted on plug and play, APKM APIs, NetConf, RESConf. I have committed to a five blogs in five days challenge with Chris. <laughs> I'm day two into that, so stay tuned for another three or four blogs from me for the next week. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. So uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, we're here in the DevNet zone. Just so you know, over there we have these learning labs. So in those learning labs, you can actually walk through, take a Coding 101 class, make your first REST call to APIC EM and say, get network devices or set QoS policy for an application. You can just go over there and do that today. Um, over there, we have some creations and as well as some booths around with the Meraki booth over here. Look at some things that people have done as they've built and implemented them. Obviously, have, we have many different um, sessions that are going on, classroom sessions that you can jump in as well. And finally, go online at developer.cisco.com. If you take a look at the DNA community, this is where all of uh, Adam's posts are appearing. So get in there and talk to us as well. So uh, thank you very much to all of our guests here. So the world of network programmability really is moving and becoming real. Uh, it's up to us as a community to get together, to establish those practices, to raise the challenges that we're having uh, to really uh, move this forward. And the opportunity is huge, so let's work together on that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you.